so they are wasting their limited self discipline on the wrong end of the process that namely making the choice ok so choice induces paralysis too much of it choice induces bad decisions what's the third bad thing that happens the third bad thing that happens is that next slide even when people manage to choose and they manage to choose well if they choose from a large set of options they are less satisfied with what they have chosen and this is for several reasons next slide the first is that you choose I don't know you choose the fish on a restaurant menu from a large set of options and it comes and it's good but it's not perfect and so you say to yourself I bet you if I'd gotten the chicken it would have been better you regret the choice of fish because it wasn't perfect and you imagine that an alternative would have been better and what happens is that because you regret the choice of fish and the reason you regret it is that there are alternatives it ends up reducing the satisfaction you get from the fish you decide to study biology and you regret any time you have a boring bio lecture you regret that you're not studying engineering or computer science or history the more options there are the more easily people can imagine that some option other than the one they chose would have worked out better would have been more satisfying and the consequence of this is that they end up getting less satisfaction out of the option they chose and the consequence of that it seems to me is that because they're getting less satisfaction out of it they're less inclined to stay with it it's so easy to imagine that if they had chosen a different course of study a different path they'd be getting more satisfaction than they're getting out of the, their current path we all know that there are dark and hard days as you uh, work your way through college and unless you can generate a certain amount of enthusiasm for what you're doing uh, the temptation to stop doing it, it can become uh, overwhelming anticipated regret uh, is the primary engine I think for paralysis because the only way to avoid regretting a decision is by not making it and so if you are really worried that you'll be sorry that you chose X don't choose at all and then there's nothing to regret of course there's something huge to regret when you adopt that strategy but I think that's what people do Next slide. related to this is what I uh, what I call missed opportunities um, you make a choice you're trying to decide where to go on vacation you're thinking about four or five places you decide that that uh, although each of them has really attractive features you can go to the Rockies you can go to the beaches in California you can go to get culture and good restaurants in Paris or you can meet nasty people in the streets of New York lots of attractive options and you choose one and let's say you made the right choice then you go and while you're there what you're thinking about is all the attractive features of the other alternatives that you passed up this is not to say I made a mistake and I'm sorry I chose it I didn't make a mistake it was the right choice but why couldn't it be that uh, I could meet nasty people uh, in the Rockies so then I can have what was good about New York nasty people and what was good about the Rockies why couldn't I have that why can't the world give me that um, and so what happens is that as you think about all that you have passed up in these other alternatives you get less satisfaction from the alternative that you've chosen and just as in the case of regret when your uh, satisfaction is reduced you're less likely to stick with it the next slide gives you an example of that uh, I can't stop thinking about all of the parking spaces back on West 85th Street so this is a little bit New York centric so imagine this couple they live in a high-rise in midtown Manhattan they're away at the Hamptons sitting on the beach it's beautiful it's sunny they have the beach to themselves but the problem is that it's August and everybody in their neighborhood is away on vacation and all the guy can think of is that he could be parking their car right in front of the building and he spends two weeks on the beach in the Hamptons thinking about two weeks of missed parking spaces this is not the right way to uh, get maximum satisfaction out of being in the Hamptons okay uh, skip the next slide skip that one please uh, when it comes to college graduates 
not, not your end of the problem, but a, nonetheless a part of the problem, what I find is that the, there's one question you don't ask graduating seniors. I've learned this the hard way. And that question is, so what are you going to do when you graduate? And the reason you don't ask them that question is that if they know, they've probably already told you or asked you for a letter of recommendation. And if they don't know, it's the last thing on earth that they want to think about. Because not only do they not know what they're going to do, they don't know how they're going to figure out what they're going to do. Uh, and at places like Swarthmore, with the students are extremely talented and they're interested in lots of things, and Swarthmore, as part of its mission, encourages people to cultivate all of their talents and all of their interests. So you, at Swarthmore, you can sort of do everything. But they know, these students do, that when they graduate they're going to have, and make a commitment about what comes next, they're going to be walking through one door and hearing lots of other doors close. And they don't know how to decide which door to walk through. Here's a very poignant quote from the next slide from the poet Sylvia Plath uh, uh, from her book The Bell Jar. She wrote, from the tip of every branch like a fat purple fig, a wonderful future beckoned and winked. One fig was a husband and a happy home and children. Another was a famous poet. Another was a brilliant professor. Another was Europe and Africa and South America. Another was an Olympic lady crew champion. And beyond and above these figs were many more I couldn't quite make out. I saw myself sitting in the crotch of this fig tree starving to death just because I couldn't make up my mind which of the figs I would choose. I wanted each and every one of them, but choosing one meant losing all the rest. And as I sat there, unable to decide, the figs began to wrinkle and go black, and one by one, they plopped to the ground at my feet. Now, I know that right now, in this very troubled economy, the notion that people have lots of options about what to do uh, seems like a fantasy. And a lot of our graduates will feel lucky that there's a single thing that they can do that will pay their rent. But you know, these days are not going to last forever. We're going to go back to a time when the world opens up, or at least lots of opportunities open up. And if you don't know how to pull the trigger and you end up paralyzed, um, you, will, uh, you will fail to take advantage of opportunities and, uh, and be considerably anxious about your inability to make uh, the wise decision. Next slide. To summarize all of this about satisfaction, what we know is that everything suffers from comparison. When you have lots of alternatives to compare your chosen option to, what will be salient to you is the ways in which these alternatives are better than what you've chosen, and that will make your chosen option uh, uh, suffer. Next slide. The last reason why uh, too much choice reduces satisfaction is that what happens when people have a lot of choice is that it seems inevitable that it raises their expectations about how good the chosen option will be. So I can illustrate this with a real example from my own life. I went to uh, The Gap to buy uh, jeans. Uh, as you can see, I'm wearing jeans. Jeans are what I wear virtually every day. And it used to take me about 30 seconds to buy jeans. I'd go in, I'd give them my size, they'd give me the jeans, out I would go. And I went in. And I said, I want a pair of jeans. And the clerk said, you want slim fit, easy fit, relaxed fit, button fly, zipper fly, stone washed, distressed, boot cut, tapered, on and on and on the options went. So I said, innocently, I want the kind that used to be the only kind. And the clerk alas, being 12 years old, had no idea what that was. And of course, as you can probably guess, they didn't make that kind anymore anyway. So I spent 40 minutes trying on all the different styles of jeans, and I walked out with the best fitting pair of jeans I had ever owned. In other words, having all that choice enabled me to do better. But I felt worse. I did better but I felt worse. Why did I feel worse? Because when jeans only came in one or two styles, I didn't expect perfect jeans. They fit however they fit. And if that was good enough, I bought them. And if not, I wore khakis. When they come in 50 or 100 styles, well, now all of a sudden I want one that's perfect. 